All right. Happy Wednesday, everybody. How we doing? The silence is golden. That means everyone's having a great Wednesday. It actually felt like summer came through today. It's humid. It's sticky. Hope everyone is uh, indoors in the nice, cool AC with a nice little glass of wine in front of them. I hope everyone's doing okay. Today we're talking about red blends and uh, really the world of red blends. We have two rinds with us today, uh, an Australian red blend, a Texas red blend, and uh, you can kind of see the agenda here on the screen. A lot to go through today. And uh, hopefully if you have any questions, pull up the chat or you can just start talking. I can hear you hopefully. Uh, which, uh, which one are we gonna start with today? Uh, we're going to actually drink both at the same time, but uh, in terms of your first taste, start with the Texas red, uh, and then we'll do the, the Australian red. Um, so in case you want to know what you're drinking, which is probably a good thing, you are drinking, the, the Texas red is the Vinovium 4 twelfths. It's basically a blend of 12 barrels of Tempranillo, 4 barrels of Graciano, so 70% to 30% Tempranillo to Graciano. Uh, a very classic Rioja blend, which we'll talk about. And then your Australian red is a 50-50 blend of uh, Syrah or Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon from McLaren Valley in the South Australia district of Australia, which we'll talk about that as well. So uh, a, lot, a lot to go over. Really, we're gonna kind of continue this conversation of uh, aromatic categories and palate building. We're gonna feed that into uh, a breakdown of the wines that we're drinking. Uh, we're going to take some notes on that. That way, when we kind of do our blending exercise at the very end, we kind of have some starting starting place of where we actually started with these wines. Uh, we're going to we're going to basically talk about what blends really are. And while that sounds like a stupid question, the reality is, is blends are very complicated. They are there for a reason, and we can break uh, we can break blends down by both uh, many different ways, both in terms of the grapes themselves, the land themselves. Um, and, and so we're going to talk about how blends are actually constructed, constructed, uh, and then how we put them back together. Uh, and then we're going to do an overview of basically key. Is that a, oh, I thought someone brought me a cookie. Thanks for that. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the, the key red blends of the world and kind of why they exist and, and, uh, kind of feed that into our, our blending exercise. So I'll probably refer back to this agenda several times throughout the, throughout the next hour or so. So hold on to your seats, ask your questions, let's get started. You should have basically two glasses of wines in front of you, uh, something to take notes with uh, for when we actually break down our wines. And then if you didn't have, one of my instructions was to have a, uh, an ounce shot glass. If you don't have an ounce shot glass, a tablespoon will work. A tablespoon, uh, basically two tablespoons is one ounce of of whatever. So uh, we will actually be doing a little bit of blending between these two wines to figure out if we can make uh, a better wine. You know, that's the whole point. Um, and that really is kind of a great segue into what the hell we're doing here in terms of red blends. Um, the whole idea behind a blend is to make a better wine. And to understand how to make a better wine, we need to kind of carry the conversation forward as to this palate building uh, that we kind of started uh, on Monday. Okay, so, uh, we're gonna pick up with aromatic categories. And I did not uh, pull out a lot of uh, graphics for this, so it's just a lot of me talking, which is fine. But um, last, last Monday, or Monday, we, we kind of started this conversation of structure. We broke structure down into six components, acid being your most important. Then we have uh, alcohol, tannin, sugar, extract, color, and aroma. Uh, today, we're gonna kind of carry this to the next level, which is what are the actual breakdowns of aroma? Uh, and then what are the key chemical components of those aromas, particularly as we talk about our major wines or our major grapes in our blends today, which is Tempranillo, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Syrah. We'll talk about Graciano a little bit, but Graciano, for all intents and purposes, is a, a minor grape. You never really see it as 100% of itself, uh, so it's typically always part of a blend, uh, and we'll talk about the reasons why that is. But really, when we talk about the three big red grapes that we're going to taste today, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, and uh, Tempranillo. Let me turn my phone off. Okay, wonderful. Um, if you are new to Zoom and you want to follow along with the chat, there is a chat button at the bottom of your screen that pops up and you can kind of see the conversation that we're all having. If you have questions, you can type it or you can just ask it. Okay. 
So <clears throat> let's talk about categories of fruit or aromatic categories. Um, this is uh, kind of going down a big rabbit hole, and so I'm going to try to streamline it a little bit so you don't get lost in the conversation. But when we talk about aromatic categories, what we're really talking about is the is the categories of fruit smells that we're tasting. And we can really break that down into five categories of aromatic components or aromatic smells. Um, first and foremost, let's start with citrus smells. That's the easy one. Uh, citrus smells include everything from uh, lemons, limes, grapefruit, oranges, tangerines, things of that nature. Um, the next category would basically be uh, tropical fruits. Tropical fruits would be anything that you think is from an island, uh, banana, star fruit, pineapple, uh, a guafa, things of that nature. Um, next category would be uh, orchard fruit. Orchard fruit is basically anything that grows in an orchard and then within the orchard fruit category is a subcategory known as stone fruits. Stone fruits are those that have a, 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 a pith in the center of them. Those would be things like apricots, peaches, quince, uh, nectarines, uh, are those. Uh, other orchard fruits would be apples and pears. Uh, all kinds of apples, all kinds of pears. Um, we can technically put plums in that, both as part of an orchard fruit and as a pithy fruit. Uh, but you'll see a lot of people reference uh, plums particularly as part of the berry family just because it's the skin of the plum that gives you um, the character of the wine not necessarily the, the, uh, the character of the flavor not necessarily the flesh of the plum um, and then we have really two berry categories we have red berries and blueberries and uh, within the red berry it's all the red berries you can think of uh, cherries strawberries uh, um, um, raspberries and then in the blue and black fruit category, blue and black berry category, it's all of those other berries. Um, the one thing that may not make sense in terms of the world berries, if you're smelling something like Kalamata olive, we will consider that part of the fruit world. Uh, while that Kalamata olive, uh, I guess it has a seed, so technically it's a fruit. It's just uh, a more savory kind of tart type of earthy bound type of fruit. Um, avocado technically is a fruit, tomatoes, cucumbers. We'll leave all of that for technically non-fruits in the world of, world of wine tasting because those start to turn into vegetal characters and we will lump all of vegetal characters as a uh, single category. So really five categories of fruit. Here's the thing. We don't really care what the actual smell of the fruit is, at least for all intents and purposes. I mean, if you're writing a tasting note or having a marketing message or trying to describe something, that's very important. What's more important is the character of the fruit. So when we talk about, let's say citrus fruit, I wanna know, is it bitter citrus fruit? Is it leaning, leaning more towards that lime and grapefruit? Is it more of the flesh of the fruit? Is it more of the peel of the fruit? Or is it a zest of that fruit? Um, and then also, is it ripe or overripe? Or, or candied or stewed or, or uh, jammy? What, you know, those are, are the things that make the most important. So. When we start talking about the wines that we're tasting today, um, the question is, is what category of fruit and what's the character of the fruit? And those are the two most important things. If you see uh, flavors as colors, meaning when you see the word lime, you think of green, or when you see the word mango and you think of orange, then, then that's fine, just right? It's, it's orange flavored and it's overripe. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it needs to be something that you understand and that when you come back um, uh, you can understand um, what it is you're talking about. Cherries aren't a stone fruit. Technically no, cherries are not a stone fruit. Cherries are still a red berry fruit even though they have a pith. Um, I guess we're still talking about larger non-berry non -berry fruit in terms of stone fruit. It's really all semantics um, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. Okay so then we have a Outside of the fruit smells, we have non-fruit smells. And non-fruit smells <clears throat> can be broken down into quite a bit of things. Um, to keep this simple, let's break it down into herbs and spices. We have herbs and spices, we have actual earthy smells like minerals and potting soil and manure and that kind of barnyard component or description that people use. And then we have fungal smells and, and moldy smells kind of kind of smells that may be a part of a fault or that may be part of the evolution of the fruit in the vineyard, like botrytis, 
uh, botrytis is a mold that takes place in the vineyard that gives your wine a very kind of honey, honey kind of character. Um, and then we have uh, other smells that lend themselves to production. Uh, production could be both oak, it could be um, malolactic fermentation, it could be um, age, uh, age being the kind of the evolution of the wine over time, but that impacts both oaky smells and fruit smells. So when we talk about uh, um, these aromatic categories, it's not just fruit that we need to pay attention to, and it's not just non-fruit or production smells. And so when we taste today and smell today, the, if the way to simplify, to get going so you're not uh, stuck, is to really think of two non-fruits and two fruits. If you can think of two non-fruits and two fruits, those are the things that will kind of propel you to the next level. Um, because it's the whole idea of just reacting to that wine that allows you to move forward in, in developing that palate. Okay, um, there are, are, when we taste our wines today, again, I mentioned there's really three big red wines, Tempranillo, Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, there are two chemical components. There's quite a bit of chemical components, but there are two chemical components that we need to talk about today. Um, and um, really, both of them are in your Australian glass. So if you would, um, go ahead and swirl and smell and then taste your Australian uh, red blend. On the smell, um, get past all the dark fruit character. Um, there is a spicy herbal component that is slightly, um, I don't know, for me, I'm gonna use the word like evergreen, um, almost medicinal, uh, almost like eucalyptus-like. Yeah, me too. Robbie just made the comment that surprised to see the Aussie wine at 13%. Um, yeah, I tried to get a restrained Australian wine to match the, the Texas wine is about 13 and 13.4%. 13 so I wanted to get an Australian wine that kind of was restrained a bit. But which, which really means that the wine is kind of underripe um, in a way. It's not the fullest bodied red wine you're ever going to have. But there's two things that we need to pull out of this wine. One, there is an element of spice. Um, and that spice um, is slightly sweet, slightly aromatic, almost like bacon fat, almost like a charcoal grill, almost like that log you get at Christmas time that is wrapped in paper that you put in your fireplace. Okay? Um, if you're not getting that, it may be some deviation of that. I would not decant. Um, I feel like the wine is a little bit too fresh and youthful for decanting. Um, so there's that kind of camphor, frankincense, kind of spicy component. Um, it can evolve almost into a, uh, a black pepper component. The other thing that's happening in this wine is that kind of underripe, under green kind of herbal thing. Um, and it, it's almost like a, a, a red roasted bell pepper. And if you can pick up on those, then we're on the same page. If you can't, no big deal. But when we talk about Syrah, and we're going to kind of carry this conversation, uh, pick up this conversation again when we get down to the breakdown of our blends. But when we talk about chemical components that are very important with red blends, particularly Cabernet-based red blends or Syrah-based red blends, it just happens that this wine is both, is that Syrah has a chemical component in it called rotodone. Rotodone is the smell and that character of black pepper and spice. Um, and in the world of a blind tasting or in the world of blending, whether we were looking for more of that or less of that is a really dead giveaway in terms of that there is some type of Syrah. Grenache can have it to some extent too, uh, but really it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that really belongs to the family of Syrah or Syrah. Syrah or Shiraz. And again, I'm going to use these varietals back and forth. They mean the same thing. Shiraz is the Australian term for the grape Syrah. It's the same grape. There's no mutation there. It's just a different uh, name of nomenclature. Um, the other thing in terms of that green, so no decanting, deducted from evergreen. 
you, you said something about I wouldn't decant this, but you were making reference to how it tasted or fla the flavor profile. Is that? E e okay, so I, maybe there's confusion about decanting. It opens the wine. Right. You can decant it, but decanting is, um, uh, okay, did this you, is kind of. Did, this you is say you would, did you say you would not decant it because that was a question someone asked or because of something of the yes. character? Of the wine? Yes, yeah, yeah. Someone had asked, should I decant this? And I said, no, you should not decant this. Okay. And I was trying to figure out what characters of the wine you were deducing that from. Y correct. Yeah, that was the Australian wine that I was talking about. Okay. Okay, so no, de no decanting. Again, decanting is really the, the, you use decanting to get rid of sediment, not really to aerate. If you're, we use that term interchangeably, uh, it's not technically correct. Um, if I need, yes, when I decant, I aerate, but really the purpose of decanting is to remove sediment if I suspect the wine to have sediment. If I need to aerate, uh, really you can do that by decanting, which is no problem, uh, but also just swirling in the glass is fine or leaving the bottle open is fine, no problem. Um, the, the thing is, is, if you are decanting to aerate, you need to be very vigorous with your decanting, meaning you literally dump the bottle upside down because the whole idea is to add oxygen. So the more oxygen you add, the better the, de the, better the aeration. So when, if you are decanting to aerate, um, then be very vigorous with your decanting. If you are not decanting to aerate just, and you're using that technique to remove sediment, then you need to be very delicate with your decanting and not tip the bottle upside down. Um, but really for aeration, for this wine, since it is a lighter bodied, lighter style of, 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 of Syrah Cab, um, I don't think decanting is necessary. But, the, but in terms of aerating, as, you, as this wine opens and breathes, what I'm trying to get out is this kind of green, evergreen, almost roasted bell pepper character out of this wine. That smell is called a pyrazine or a pyrazine. Um, it is very completely unique to the Cabernet family. And, and so it adds a level of herbal character. And in, a, in the blind tasting, that pyrazinic character is what lends itself to the Cab family. And when I say the Cab family, um, it's going to be everything we talk about it within the Bordeaux blend, which consists of basically Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, and Carmenere. Even though Merlot was in that Bordeaux blend, technically Merlot is not part of, of the Cabernet family. Okay, so let's switch over to the, the Texas Red. Very classic blend historically from Rioja. This wine is 70% Tempranillo, 30% Graciano. In its youth, um, <clears throat> Tempranillo tends to be a, um, a varietal that has both high tannin, high acid. Uh, it tends to be lighter in color and that's why Graciano is added. Graciano is really beautiful for color. Um, and so, but as a varietal, Tempranillo tends to be almost like a tobacco cherry dill thing. Um, and it, it's almost sweeter on the palate or on the nose than, than both Cabernet and uh, Syrah or Shiraz. And so really in terms of what we're looking for in the Tempranillo, we're, in terms of categories of fruit, we have this blackberry, uh, kind of like a dark bean cherry, black cherry, verging on black fruit. Okay, uh, and then the other non-fruit would be kind of this um, medicinal character, almost like dill, eucalyptus, menthol, tobacco leaf. Uh, you could even call it a, a little bit of a kind of a like a like a pipe tobacco. It's a little bit sweeter. Very classic Tempranillo smells, particularly when you put it in oak. And mainly, we're talking about uh, American oak here. Okay, so let's go back and what we need to do is really define these wines. And this is kind of where your notes come in. We're gonna use these notes uh, at the very end when we kind of come back and do our blending exercise. So <clears throat> you can pick, let's start with the Australian one since we just tasted the Texas one. Actually, 
let's start with the Texas one since we just tasted the Texas one. Let's um, take another taste. Um, let's define its structure. Let's define its fruit character. Let's define its body. So the, if you remember from Monday's class, if you participated in Monday's class, we, we defined very clearly what a medium bodied, medium dry wine was through Chardonnay. The question that we need to ask, is this wine fuller bodied than Chardonnay? Yes. Pretty simple, the answer is yes. So we know that we're not lighter bodied than medium bodied. Okay, so the question is, where are we on the body scale? Um, is this the fullest bodied red wine you've ever had? Not really. Um, so I would say that we are medium plus, medium to full bodied, but not yet full bodied. And in terms of dryness, um, the wine is also medium dry, meaning it's, it's the same level of dryness as our Chardonnay. Obviously it's one step fuller in body, but it's still got fruitiness. It's not necessarily incredibly dry, bone dry. And then in terms of categories of fruit, I would say definitely the world of red berries verging on blackberries. Uh, and then the character of that fruit would be ripe to maybe slightly overripe. Um, nothing really is extreme. It's not jammy, it's not uh, candied. There's no kind of cordial component. It's not like a, um, a liquor element. Um, and then in terms of non-fruit, things like uh, dill and vanilla and um, uh, a little bit of tobacco leaf, maybe a little bit of new leather comes through. Okay. Feel free to add your own descriptions, but we're just making a, a brief note about what this wine is. Um, and then we're going to put the pieces together at the very end when we start to blend. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to the Australian red and let's do the same thing. Let's define its body, its dryness, and its categories of fruit and its character of fruit. Okay, is it fuller body than Chardonnay? Absolutely. It is <coughs> drier than my Texas red. Um, technically, I would drink this wine before my Texas red based off of how it's tasting today. It's much drier um, than the Texas red, meaning there's not a lot of fruit there. It's a little bit more uh, rustic, a little bit more earthbound. Um, the fruit that is there is almost like uh, um, cinnamons and <laughs> like red hot. You get a tiny bit of liquor jam on the Texas wine. Okay, no problem. A little grassy, definitely a little grassy. Um, the character of the fruit on the, on the Australian wine is it's more red fruit. It's almost like slightly overcooked baked red fruit. You're kind of going into red cherries, strawberries, almost like a red licorice element. And then there's also like this a little bit of a spicy component that's a little bit cinnamon, um, a little bit red hot, uh, a little bit almost like a sweet paprika character. Um, and then the other non-fruits is you get red spice, totally red spice. Um, and then you also get with the Australian wine, you get this kind of campfire red bell pepper component on the aroma. I don't necessarily get that on the palate, but it's definitely adding some level of complexity on the aromatics. Okay, so let's summarize. The Australian wine, <laughs> a little bit more riper. That um, alcohol is slightly noticeable. The, the character of the fruit is slightly more ripe. It's almost kind of um, uh, baked in a way, a little bit more spicy. It's not nearly as uh, um, rich as the Texas Tempranillo is. Um, the fruit character is a little bit softer in terms of intensity of fruit. The body is medium to full bodied uh, and it's dry. The Texas Tempranillo blend, it's medium to full bodied also. Uh, it is a medium dry, however, meaning there's a little bit more fruitiness, a little bit more uh, uh, just uh, unctuous fruit character on the palate. And then the characters of the fruit are a little bit more black and blue fruit, kind of leading into uh, blackberry, black cherry, even the plum skin, a little bit sweet components from a sweet tobacco. And then there's an herbal component that is kind of more aligned with dill or coconut or vanilla. I got questions, it looks like.
two left feet, man. Molly Ducker, two left feet is a really great wine, uh, but that's a true Barossa Shiraz. Um, it looks like Rob is answering. Molly Ducker is hot, is a hot, hotter, doesn't hit 15.5 or there or thereabouts. Yeah, what is the <laughs> Vivian? What's the alcohol on your Molly Ducker? 16 percent. They, yeah. I yeah. Say yeah. So, uh, Molly Ducker two left feet is a uh, as a Shiraz from Barossa. You are drinking a much fuller bodied wine than we are. The fruit character is way more pronounced. Um, that wine is pretty much slapping you in the face as you drink it. <laughs> it it's a, so much heavier. Yeah, that's what yeah. I would say. Richer, heavier than yeah. 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 All right, just that was the best we could come up with at our liquor store. Hey, no, I appreciate you, appreciate you finding that. Sorry, we couldn't get wines to you in Oklahoma. I taste a bit I of know. it's okay. Twelfth, yeah, I think that the combination of uh, of that kind of coconut, sweet coconut, a little bit of a kind of an herbal, and then the blue and black fruit is kind of lending itself to that cocoa powder. But that's also um, the char of a barrel is kind of can give you that element of cocoa or chocolate. So uh, we're all, it looks like we're all on the same page. If you're not, no problem, keep drinking, we'll get there. Okay, so um, let's do this. I, I did wanna talk a little bit about, about McLaren Vale before we kind of get into the whole blends so you kind of understand a little bit about the growing area. I do wanna talk a little bit about Texas um, and then we'll kind of pick up where we left off. So I'm gonna take this off our screen, our agenda. I am going to pull up a map of Australia. Maybe it's better. Let me share it through Zoom. All right. <clears throat> Okay, so hopefully this is a better image. Um, th this was taken off of uh, the Wine Regions of Australia website, which is a government association that promotes and helps promote uh, the wines of Australia, um, which they need a lot of help. You know, last year they had these terrible fires that ravaged basically uh, everywhere, um, everywhere except for the, the, um, the Western Australia and the growing areas there. Um, every, every region that we're gonna talk, well, the region that we're gonna talk about definitely was devastated by fires last year. So um, Australia wines are one of these places that ha came out of nowhere in the 80s with uh, yellow yellowtail, the critter wines, and uh, dominated the market because they had amazing wines at very cheap prices <clears throat> that were very um, uh, consumer friendly in terms of their fruitiness, their body, it was very approachable. Uh, and then uh, they fell out of favor because uh, the, the market evolved and uh, nobody wanted a $6.99 magnum of uh, yellowtail cabernet or shiraz uh, because their palates evolved and then they started to introduce these wines that were really incredible but at really expensive prices and people would much rather have spent their money on something else they they the brand of australian wine was cheap kind of everyday drinking wine um, and so when they introduced expensive wines it necessarily wasn't what the market wanted um, today, the, the prices have come down for their mid-tier and their top-tier wines, or at least more in line with their equivalent quality around the world. And you just got to find, like every other place on the planet, the best wines are always there, but you always got to seek out uh, the really great wines of any given place. Okay, so when we talk about Australia, uh, really there are uh, six main growing areas. You can see them as Western Australia, South Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and Tasmania. South Australia and Victoria are really the, the main um, places for, for, for where wine comes from, really between those two regions, if you will, or Appalachians, um, uh, produces really 85 to 90 percent of all the wines produced in Australia. And in really, South Australia is the main producer. 
So uh, if you remember from previous classes, the way that we classify growing areas is by a region. A region is divided into an appellation. An appellation is divided into a commune or village. And then we have vineyards. And then we have basically blocks within a vineyard. In Australia, they have a similar, similar thing. They approach it slightly different. What they have is a state, which you can see the, the five states or the six states with Tasmania, so six states. And then they divide them into zones. Uh, and then within a zone are regions and then subregions. So slightly different nomenclature and semantic there, but a similar idea in terms of a geographical area. So when we talk about McLaren Vale, we are, where's Barossa Valley? Barossa Valley is in South Australia. So hopefully you can see my cursor. This is South Australia. And this is known, uh, South Australia really is broken down into four primary zones. Um, and we really consider like Adelaide kind of like a, a, a giant zone, kind of a, a mother zone, if you will. It's a zone, it's a growing area that has three zones within it. And um, these three zones basically include uh, the Barossa, the Barossa Valley. <clears throat> it also includes uh, Fleury Valley, which is where McLaren Vale is. And then it includes uh, kind of a mountain zone, uh, kind of where number 10 is, number 10 and number 11. Number 11 being uh, Clare Valley, which is the most important growing region in Australia for uh, cool climate Riesling. Uh, so if you ever saw the movie Psalm, uh, Clare Valley Riesling is the one that they were smelling and he opens up and he goes, oh, it smells like a fresh pack of tennis balls and a water hose. Okay, that was Clare Valley Riesling. Um, so when we talk about McLaren Vale, we are basically uh, number 17 on the list, which is on the coast. And what that means is that it has a, a maritime climate. It is influenced heavily by the body of water next to it. And it's also very much influenced by the mountain range to the north of it. And so we have a, a situation where while you would think you would have a, a humid environment uh, being close to the ocean, that is true, but then that humid environment is mitigated by uh, the mountain range. So there is a rain shadow effect, meaning there is no rain uh, next to that mountain range. So you have cool breeze coming off the, uh, the, the Southern Ocean there, um, and it basically mitigates the weather so you don't get really extreme heat and you also don't get extreme cold. And so when we talk about McLaren Vale as a region, uh, first and foremost, it is really known for Shiraz and Cabernet, so hence the blend. But recently, uh, McLaren Vale is really where we're getting a lot of great Grenache, okay? Um, it is a kind of a more temperate climate, meaning not as hot as the Barossa Valley, but it's definitely not as cold as, let's say, Clare Valley. Clare Valley kind of being in the foothills of, of the mountains right there, okay? Um, and then you can kind of see the rest of Australia. I mean, to kind of give you an idea of distance between Adelaide, where South Australia is, and Perth and the Western Australia, uh, that's, that, between those two capitals are basically 1,300 miles apart from each other. Um, and then in South Australia, the most important growing area in Australia, we have the super zone that's Adelaide, that includes McLaren Vale, the Barossa, Adelaide Hills, places like that. And then we have what is known as the, the Limestone Coast, which is where the most famous Cabernet Sauvignon from Australia comes from, which is number 26 here on the map, which is the Kunawara. Kunawara is very famous for its Cabernet. It's very famous because it's unique in that there's a lot of eucalyptus forests around Kunawara, and that Cabernet tends to have a lot of eucalyptus component uh, in the wine and, uh, and it's just become known for that. <clears throat> okay, so let me, I didn't pull up a map of Texas, so let me not share this. Let me stop sharing. So your McLaren Vale wine is basically a 50-50 blend Syrah, 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 Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon from McLaren Vale. So a, a, a a, a moderate climate uh, for in terms of temperature, uh, but it tends to have a little bit more freshness than Barossa, a little bit more acid, a little bit more finesse, not nearly as a kind of brooding as a, uh, as a Barossa wine would be. Texas, I'm assuming we're all familiar with Texas. Vivian, if you're not familiar with Texas, 
I'm sorry, but you've been here, so you kind of know the landscape a bit. Um, when we talk about Texas, we have really eight growing areas. The Texas Hill Country is at the very center of the state. Within it are nested AVAs, mainly the Bell Mountain AVA and the Fredericksburg AVA. All of them are multi-county. Uh, in terms of the Texas Hill Country, it basically is, let's say, from Austin on the east side all the way to Junction on the west side. And then it goes from the northern part of San Antonio to basically San Saba. That gives you an idea of kind of the boundary of the Texas Hill Country. The Texas Tempranillo that you're drinking in the 412s is from a vineyard in Valley Mills, Valley Mills, Texas, which is uh, uh, near Waco by 45 minutes to an hour or so, which is technically not in a growing area. It is not within the Texas Hill Country. Um, there is a river that runs through the region called Bosque Valley. Uh, I, I hope that one day they will file for AVA status because it is a region that is very much mitigated by the river uh, and then the fact that it is in the valley. This Tempranillo uh, is the Australian climate as the same as the Texas Hill Country. Um, uh, let me come back to that question. There are some similarities, but there are some major differences. So the Tempranillo in the 412s is a 13-year-old. This year will be the 14th uh, year of this wine, the 14th leaf. It is a north-facing hillside slope in the, the estate of Valley Mills Vineyard. Um, and it's, it's, got a, it's unique in the sense that it's north of the hill country, so it's slightly cooler, slightly longer growing season. So typically when we harvest Tempranillo in the hill country, kind of, uh, let's call it late August-ish, um, they're harvesting this Tempranillo in the first week of September, typically. Um, and so we get a little bit more ripeness. We get a little bit less kind of rustic character, a little bit more fruity character, and therefore a little bit more body. Um, and then the Graciano in the blend is from the Texas High Plains, the, the, the next main growing area in Texas, basically all the way from uh, the border of New Mexico to uh, west, of, west of Lubbock. And there we have a high plain. It's at altitude anywhere between 3,200 and 4,200 feet above sea level. Um, it's flat, it's dusty. Um, it doesn't have nearly the amount of limestone that Tempranillo likes uh, compared to a little bit more clay and loam. Loam being a combination of limestone and clay. So the, the soil is a little slightly different. Longer growing season, typically the high plains is anywhere between two and three weeks longer in terms of growing season in the hill country and that's just because of its altitude uh, and also that the fact that it's further further north okay so let me go back and answer ted's question ted and angie uh, the australian climate the same as the texas hill country uh, in terms of temperature uh, i would say similar uh, but really outside of temperature it's not alike at all in the sense that um, because uh, McLaren Val is next to the coast, it doesn't really have um, any issues with uh, frost the way that we have issues with frost or, or hail. Um, their biggest issue is drought. And while we have drought issues, we seem to have issues with rain in the middle of the growing season. So we typically, typically the hill country, last time I did this research, the hill country is anywhere between 25 and 30 inches of rain of, of rainfall annually. The high plains is right around 18 inches of rain annually. Typically that occurs in the spring and in the winter. Um, in, in McLaren Vale, it's a little bit different. They still get quite a bit of rain, um, but they, they have no rain in the growing season. So when you look at kind of how um, Australia is set up, a lot of those regions, particularly in South Australia, are 100% organic or bi biodynamic because they have no disease pressure in the growing season. The other thing is that their soils are, are very sandy soils in general, and most of them, really 80, 80 plus percent of all the vineyards in South Australia are own rooted and have never been hit by phylloxera. Um, and so you get much older vines. McLaren Vale as a region was first planted in the 1880s. Um, and so while in terms of temperature, there's similarities, the, the growing environment is very different in terms of actual uh, limitations or factors that affect the growing uh, in a given harvest. So similar, but not similar to the irrigate. 
Uh, depends on the vine. If it most, a lot of there's a lot of dry farms. Let me let me pull this up. This is a this is a good segue. So let's do a little. Uh, even though we have already broke down our wines and we've talked a little bit about it, I pulled some stuff off of Wine Folly because it's easy to get access to their information and it's readily available. Okay. You gotta have leaves. Apparently y'all like the leaves on Monday, so I added more leaves. Okay, here's the here's the kind of primary flavors of of Tempranillo according to Wine Folly. Cherry, dried fig, cedar, tobacco, dill, very classic Tempranillo flavors. Um, I think what's interesting to, to kind of pay attention here to is the body of the wine. It's never really full bodied. It's, it's got high tannin, but not super high tannin. It's got high acid, but not super high acid. And then it never really tends to be, a, excuse me, I think we should turn every time I hiccup into a drinking game. Because it seems like <laughs> it seems, seems like every class I have hiccups, or I have the wine burps. Technical a technical term, uh, and then alcohol is never super high in alcohol, just because it doesn't really uh, get that right typically in a growing season. The growing season is not that uh, intense in terms of heat, and there's not that much sugar development in the vineyard. Very classic primary flavors of Tempranillo. Yes, so. Ted is asking, is the dill what gives the green grass flavor? Yes, you can call that dill. Um, as that dill becomes uh, older, it becomes a little bit more dried herb, almost like sage, rosemary, oregano, which there becomes a little bit more kind of aromatic and dusty. Okay, so Tempranillo flavors. Here's your classic Tempranillo leaf, tiny leaf. Tempranillo leaf's kind of uh, the space between the arms of the leaf are, are very close together. Um, just they're, they're basically slightly smaller than the palm of your hand. They're not a big leaf and they're very kind of tight in terms of the arms of the leaf. All right, and then we have uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, classic flavors, cherry, black currant, cedar, baking spice, graphite, depending on where it's grown. Graphite, you know, people call that lead pencil, but you need a dark alluvial kind of granitic soil to get that graphite character. Um, and then it's not as dry um, or, or slightly more dry or can be slightly more dry than Tempranillo. Uh, obviously it can be very full bodied, but there's also expressions that are not nearly as full bodied. Uh, medium to high tannin, so it tends to have higher tannins than Tempranillo, it tends to have lower acid than Tempranillo and it tends to be slightly higher in alcohol on average. Okay, and then your classic Cabernet leaf, kind of a goofy looking leaf, but it definitely has character. It's, only, it's, a, it's a leaf only a mother could love. <laughs> And then we have uh, the last big varietal that we're tasting is Syrah. So Syrah is, is really kind of the, the first grape that we are tasting that lends itself to these blue and black fruits. Um, while we talk about ripeness of a thing, uh, we've all had, hopefully we've had very ripe, very full bodied Cabernet. Um, and when you get really ripe, full bodied Cabernet, you tend to get very dark graphite, lead, blueberry, blackberry, kind of dense black and blue fruit. Um, that is an entirely a byproduct of how long it is uh, evolved on the vine, and meaning the phenolic character, the, the ripeness of color and tannin over time. So as that Cabernet vine um, grows throughout the growing season, um, the longer it hangs, the, the, the more color it extracts, the more tannins that it extracts, and therefore you get a fuller bodied wine. Um, one of the things I failed to mention as we're going through this is, uh, is kind of the character of the, of the grape in the vineyard. Um, since we're on Syrah, let's talk about that and then we'll backtrack. Syrah is a varietal that is, is, is beautiful for places like Texas, um, except for the fact that it's a pain in the ass in the vineyard. It's good for Texas in the sense that it is late budding, meaning it, 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 on most vintages, it'll, it'll bud out past your early frost season so it'll bud out in mid in mid-april 
um, early to mid-April, or excuse me, mid to late April. Um, and then it is also early ripening. Because it doesn't have this green pyrazine bell pepper component that Cabernet has, it doesn't need as long of a growing season um, for it to actually reach maturity to the point where you can harvest it. And even in its, even in its youth or even as a, a vine that's picked prematurely, uh, Syrah is one of these varietals that tends to always have a blue and black uh, berry component along with a little bit of spice uh, a lot in the mixture. Cabernet, on the other hand, um, is a varietal that is, it's, it's late budding, meaning it avoids frost, but it's also very late ripening. And the problem with late ripening varietals, particularly let's say in Texas, is we have rain in our growing season. So the, 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 the probability that you are going to uh, get to the point where you either have to make a decision if to harvest or not to harvest because rain is coming is highly likely. And in like last year, what ended up happening is it basically, uh, the, we had a temperature spike in mid-August and temperatures got up to 104, 105 degrees during the day in the high plains. And basically vines started to shut down and then we got a bunch of rain in middle of August, uh, which created a lot of problems because that Cabernet could never really fully ripe. And then um, Tempranillo, Tempranillo is both uh, late budding um, and early ripening, except that uh, it is prone to diseases. Uh, and particularly here in the hill country and around Texas and anywhere you're, you're near a body of water, th places like Pierce, things like Pierce's disease become a major issue. Okay, and then the last leaf to show you is the Syrah leaf, kind of a more classic leaf. It's like a Canadian maple, eh? <laughs> so Tempranee, uh, Syrah leaf is a little bit more classic looking. Okay. All right, guys, so let's kind of move the conversation forward. Keep drinking. We're going to come back to our wine, so you'll definitely need to have some left over. We're going to talk about what blends really are. And I know that that sounds like a silly question, but there's a purpose for a blend. Uh, the whole idea is we're trying to make a, a better wine. Ultimately, the parts of a wine need to be, the, the, all the parts, the whole is greater than, the, than each individual part. And that's really the whole idea. Um, when we talk about blends, let's start from the vineyard, then we'll go to the grape, and then we'll go to the actual technique of blending and the ways in which we apply a blend. So when we talk about uh, from the vineyard blends, um, there's, there's two terms that we need to talk about. One is the idea of monoculture and the other is the idea of polyculture. And when we talk about monoculture or polyculture, this is, when we talk about monoculture, monoculture is a, is a specific varietal planted in a specific place. That's kind of how We'll call that the, the French model. That's what the French have taught us is put grapes in the place where they wanna be because that's where they're best suited and they're gonna make the best wines as a result of that. The other approach to this is polyculture. And we're gonna talk about one of our most famous wines being Chateauneuf de Pop um, and, and traditional Rhone style wines, which is when you have a growing environment that is native or has indigenous varietals growing on it, um, particularly when we talk about central and southern Italy is where this mentality comes from that then spreads to really the southern part of France. Um, we have these varietals that are indigenous to a particular place and instead of uh, really understanding uh, the, uh, the, the mechanism that makes that grape flourish, we, we just disregard that and we make a wine out of it. So for example, if, if we have a vineyard and we have indigenous varietals growing, and let's say it's 20% of grape A and 20% of grape B and then 60% of grape C. What we, in reality will be done is we would harvest all those grapes all at once and make one wine, assuming that I'm a small producer, and that will become kind of like a, a house style, a, a, a farm style, style of wine. Um, and so the whole idea of polyculture is 
it's not so much a planting a specific grape in a particular place that's best suited for that grape. It's this idea that these grapes have always been growing here. Let's make a wine out of what's been growing here, but n not really understanding the principles of, 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 um, of uh, harvesting a single grape at a, at a particular time to make the best wine out of that one grape. It's about making a style of wine that best represents that location. And so that's the idea of polyculture, which is very common still around the world, particularly in central and southern Italy, is this idea of polyculture. So polyculture, in terms of vineyard, is also a type of blending. It's a, it's a field blend is really what it is, okay? So um, then we have, um, let's, let's go to the types of blending grapes that there are. In the world of blending grapes, there's really two types of blending grapes. You have what is considered a neutral blending grape, uh, meaning a grape that is, while it's added to the wine, it's there for uh, uh, volume expansion more so than character expansion. And then the other one is structural blending grapes. These are grapes that you add, um, that add structure to a wine. And those structure things could be any of the six things that we've talked about. Uh, acid, sugar, tannin, alcohol, extract, color, and aroma. Okay. So when we talk about neutral blending grape, we're literally adding it to make more of that same wine that has very little influence from that neutral grape that allows me to kind of amplify my production. Um, the most important grapes in the world, excuse me, the most planted grapes in the world traditionally are neutral blending grapes. Uh, historically in California, we used to blend uh, Chardonnay with French Columbard. Columbard was uh, a very heavily planted neutral grape. It was there just as a kind of an economic extender, if you will. Um, there's other examples all around the world. Uh, we can talk about Graciano, but Graciano has some structure to it, so it's not really a neutral blending grape. And then structural blending grape is basically, they add structure. And so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and talk about, uh, and then I'll come back to uh, the, the blending philosophy, which is, and let me put up my agenda so you kind of can follow along here. So I am, I, I've kind of started talking about varietals under what, are blends really, neutral blending grapes, structural blending grapes. And then I'm gonna jump down and talk about the Bordeaux and the Meritage um, along with the others. And then we'll kind of back up and talk about the rest. <coughs> okay, so when we talk about Bordeaux, the, the most important grape in the bottle, assuming we're on, the, on the, the main primary Cabernet growing area, which is the left bank of Bordeaux, um, the other four blending grapes can be Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Malbec. Um, so the question is, is what do those other varietals add? Those are all structural blending grapes. Petit Verdot and Graciano are very similar. They are very dark grapes and they're highly aromatic grapes. And so those are used really for coloring agent and aromatics, okay? Uh, Cabernet Franc is very important because it lends acid for one, uh, but it also lends more cherry character. It lends a lot of cherry fruit and acid. It's much lighter bodied, it's much less tannin, um, but it does have really pretty acid to it and it also has really great kind of true cherry uh, color or uh, flavor. Merlot is fruity. Merlot adds a little bit of weight, roundness to the palate, a little bit more fruitiness to the palate, uh, which is very classic Merlot. Uh, and then Malbec. Malbec is also there for just a little bit of um, Malbec always reminds me of the guy on the Old Spice commercials. It's kind of like a masculine type of persona. It's there to add a little bit of uh, kind of defined structure, a little bit of a, of a kind of a, um, a more masculine edge to the wine. It's not very common that you see Malbec and Bordeaux blends anymore. Um, traditionally, that was a very common varietal along with Carmenere. But today, typically what we see is Cabernet, Cab Franc, Merlot, and Petit Verdot in the blend. Okay, um, I will say the word meritage. It is not a French word, it is not meritage. It is an American word, meritage, which is a Bordeaux blend in California. <clears throat> oh, that shrunk, let me zoom back in. Okay, the next kind of uh, famous red blends we have are CDPs. You can see them abbreviated as CDPs. These, that's a Chateau Neuf de Pop, which is the most famous red blend coming from the Rhone Valley. And then the Rhone Valley blend, which is classically known as the GSM blend, a Grenache Syrah Mouvedre blend. Okay, 
Um, what's unique about the Chateau Neuf de Platte blend classically is that that is a polyculture wine, meaning it's a field blend. So traditionally, a Chateau Neuf de Pop is a wine that can be made up with up to 13 different grapes. And while Grenache is the most important red grape in the blend, uh, along with Syrah, along with Mouvedre, basically those other 10 grapes can be polyculture. Um, and so it is a field blend based off of a location. So again, kind of going back to this idea of blends, we can't just assume that it's happening in the lab around the table with finished wines. Sometimes it's done traditionally and classically from the vineyard forward. Uh, and then the Rhone blend again is the GSM. Uh, we see the GSM blend all over the place in the new world. It's very common in California, Texas, Australia. I mean, it's everywhere. So Grenache, Syrah, Mouvedre. Typically, it, le it, it leads and is dominated by Grenache. Uh, sometimes uh, you see them where that's not the case. It's still technically a GSM blend, even though the Grenache is not the most dominant varietal in the blend. <clears throat> Uh, the other most important red, red blend is Chianti or Chianti Classico. This is traditionally a 70% Sangiovese blend and then 30% of other indigenous varietals. And now in Chianti and in Chianti Classico, we can have up to 10% of a French varietal, Cab uh, or Merlot. And then the last uh, big red blend is the Rioja, which is, again, classically 70% Tempranillo and 30% Graciano. Uh, it can also have other grapes in it like Garnacha or Mezuelo, which is uh, Carignan. So let's go back up and now I'm going to talk about, uh, we've talked about an overview of famous red blends. We're going to go back up and talk about uh, a pickup where we left off in terms of what blends really are. And so now we have, obviously we've had, it's easy to have varietal blends. You have like we have a 50-50 Cab Syrah and we have a 70-30 Tempranillo Graciano. Um, okay, the question is, is why did we make those blends? Part of that answer is gonna come out when we do our little exercise here later on, but really we're trying to make a more complete wine. Either that Tempranillo was not complete, we needed Graciano, one for color, one for aromatics. Uh, it got really great color and it's got really nice perfume. So either that blend works or it does not work. For the, the Australian wine, the 50-50 Syrah, Shiraz, Cabernet, um, Syrah, tends to, Syrah te tends to be a little bit void of fruitiness. Um, so the fact that I've added Cabernet just added a, a lot of fruit character to it, but it also kind of enhanced body um, without necessarily kind of making the wine a little bit more bitter and austere. Um, so again, we're gonna talk about when we get to the exercise, uh, doing this a little bit more. Okay, so let, now we're on to parcels, which is a very interesting idea of blending. Um, I have 100% of a varietal. I'm in a, I'm in a growing area that has multiple vineyards. I'm gonna make a 100% varietal wine from that grape from multiple vineyards is the idea, which is a very common theme throughout the world. So on Monday, we had white burgundy. We had a, 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 white, a, a white burgundy, a Chardonnay from the Mekon, which was a village level Mekon, um, which means that that Chardonnay was sourced from multiple vineyards to make a Chardonnay, okay? Which is very common. We also see that in, 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 um, in Germany with Riesling. We see that really all over the world. You see that in Napa Valley uh, with Cabernet, you know, you're trying to produce the best style of Cabernet that you can from the given vintage. And so part of that is using multiple vintage sites and still blending with the same varietal, just from different locations within, the, within that exact growing area. Okay, so that's the idea of parcel blending. Then we have vintage blending. Um, vintage blending is all about creating a consistent style year over year over year. The best examples of vintage blending are champagne. Champagne by law for non-vintage wines can have up to 15% of wines from previous years in it. Um, kind of the, the extreme example of vintage blendings would be like a 20 year old Tawny Port or a, a Madeira that has you know, 50, 60 years on it that is actually a Solera method, meaning it's a blend, uh, uh, a style of production that is used to 
take in new wines, blend it with older vintage wines, and at some point in the future, you're gonna pull out a wine that is consistent with previous releases. So the whole idea with vintage blending is to create a consistent style year over year so you can develop a brand. And so when you buy, when you go out to your grocery store and you buy kind of your average um, kind of uh, champagne or sparkling wine, none of those wines have dates on them, meaning a vintage date. All of them are non-vintage wines and we can assume that those are non-vintage blends. The, the Probably the more appropriate term would be a multi-vintage because they are still, vint they were harvested at some point. It's not like we just magically created grapes somewhere. Um, th they are technically blends from multiple vintages. And so this idea of multi-vintage blends is really geared towards creating and maintaining a, a brand, which is super, super important, particularly for these uh, large, large producers that have to sell their wines in 100 plus different countries. And it needs to be the same regardless if you buy it in the winter or in the summer or wherever it may be. Okay, and then the last kind of way of blending is style blending. Um, this is a little bit more practical and hands-on in the winery. <clears throat> um, if you're familiar with how wines are made, um, well, let me back up. Let's go back to the vineyard. In a vineyard, you have uh, different blocks within a vineyard, and those producers that have the means and the capability, they will typically harvest and treat each block within a vineyard separately. And then after those wines are produced, if there's enough volume or enough reason to figure out how to blend these wines together, they'll do so. Um, so style blending really pertains to how a particular block or a, a vineyard is treated and then how that vineyard is then, or those blocks are then uh, blended together. Meaning I have some wines that let's say, uh, let's talk about Cabernet Sauvignon specifically. There's some Cabernet Sauvignon that was harvested two weeks before another block of Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, some of that Cabernet was destemmed. Some of that Cabernet was then put into uh, neutral oak or new oak or a partial of both new and neutral oak, or some of it may have been put into a, a large format barrel. So in reality, I have all these small lots of wine that I may have processed separately that in the end somehow have to come back together into a formal blend uh, mainly because I need to have enough volume to sell, a, to sell the wine. Um, so when we talk about style blending, we are really talking about techniques applied in the vineyard and in the winery to produce a, a wine that may be a different style or technique applied to the same grape in the same vineyard or maybe even in a different vineyard that then is used to combine and make a, a complete wine. Um, part of this discussion with blending is also geared towards uh, stability. <clears throat> so we have, you know, in winemaking, we have the idea to, um, okay, I need to make sure that my chemistry is correct so that I have a, a wine that does not become a microbial disaster. Uh, and so I can, I can either add additives or I can find wines that have those attributes and blend in. Mainly what I'm talking about are, are wines that have, if I have a wine that has a very, a uh, high pH, meaning lo a low acid wine. Low acid wines are not necessarily the best things. While they are ready to drink at a much younger age, they don't have a shelf life because they don't have acid there to protect them. So instead of adding acid from a, from a, from a powdered source or pre-fermentation perspective, I can blend in a wine that has higher acid. Uh, same thing for color, same thing for tannin, same thing for alcohol and sugar. So if you are blending in wines that add some level of structure to your wine, ultimately what you're gonna get is a wine that is slightly more stable as a result of that blend. And you may do that from a, from a preference, you may do that from a stylistic perspective, uh, but you may also need to do that because you need a safe, a safe wine that can be uh, uh, stored properly. So here's what we're gonna do. If you could please pour, um, Let's do this. If you have a third glass, grab a third glass. If not, don't worry about it. But I need one empty glass. Okay, and then if you do have a tablespoon or a shot glass, we're gonna, do, we're gonna start 50-50. Let's not make life complicated. So we're gonna put 50% of the Australian in one glass, 50% of the Tempranillo in that same glass, two ounces of wine total. 
Or if your shot glass is eight ounces, then kudos to you. <laughs> you know, this is kind of, this is my two ounces. Kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like in a glass. Oh, I, I was going to drink it on my shot glass. Yeah, so mix, mix them, mix them with your, um, mix them. So now essentially what we have, if we can do the math, so essentially now what we have is we have a 25% uh, Cabernet, 25% Syrah, 35% Tempranillo, and 15% Graciano. Shot, hey Don, this is uh, your two glasses, your two wines in one glass situation. I hope you're having a good time. Okay, so let's give it a swirl, give it a smell, and then let's, let's describe this wine. If we made a worse wine, that's okay. <laughs> It's not, it's just part of the, part of the challenge. Okay, so as I'm swirling and smelling, um, <clears throat> the wine seems to be a little bit more, arom like it's lifted out of the glass a little bit more. Maybe the alcohol becomes a little bit more volatile and it's becoming more aromatic as, as it sits in the glass. Um, I got a little bit of um, kind of a, it, it's definitely in that world of cherry fruit, red berried fruit. I still get my kind of strawberry jam, maybe a little bit of red licorice. That blue fruit component that was in my Tempranillo is somehow now taking a back seat. I still get my spicy character. It's almost like the Australian wine is slightly dominating the Texas wine, at least aromatically. Okay, so then we, okay, let's, so now we have to figure out, do we like that? Do we want, or do we not like that? Oh, on the palate, it got way more bitter than I would want, um, at least initially. The finish is longer. The palate is broader on both of them, or at least now with the blend, the palate's a little bit more rounded. Um, it did cut the acid of the Texas wine. It's spicy. Alcohol's noticeable. Slightly bitter on the finish. Uh, red fruit dominant on the palate. Oh, it's kind of oaky. You can kind of taste the oak come forward. Um, what I miss is kind of that, that silky texture of that Tempranillo. Um, I, I, miss that a I miss that more. For me, I, I, my preference is a little bit more. I love blue and black, black fruited wines, so I want a little bit more of that character, a little bit less of that kind of spicy red hot character. So I, for me, what I would like to do, and you can kind of go in whatever direction you want, but let's, let's go two more as a group. Um, so the next blending trial we're gonna do is, we're gonna go, um, oh, we did two ounces. We're gonna do a one ounce of the Texas one and then a half ounce of the, of the Australian. And then the next, and then the third round will be the opposite of that and then we'll see where we land. So go ahead and do one ounce Texas, half ounce, of the Australia. And then what you end up with is a, you end up with a 33% Syrah, 33% Cabernet Sauvignon, 47% uh, Tempranillo, and a 20% Graciano blend. Okay, so on the nose, uh, the, the, the darker fruit, the, it's not yet blue fruit like it was by itself, the Tempranillo, but the, but the kind of a black cherry component started to come back, a little bit more of like a red plum skin. I don't really perceive the alcohol nearly as much. It tastes, it smells like it's gonna be a little bit more fruity on the palate. It's got softer, softer mouthfeel. The acid is more pronounced. Um, meaning this, this version makes your mouth salivate a little bit more, um, a little bit more of that rusticity comes through. It doesn't feel as full bodied. The bitter finish has kind of gone away. It's enjoyable. I like this. I like this version. Uh, Rob, Robbie, oh, Robbie. <laughs> is it, I don't know why people call you Robbie. Uh, Rob basically said that he feels like the tannins are more pronounced in both of these blends than, than the wines on their own. That's an interesting observation. Yeah, that's a, for me, I feel like that, that second blend is a little bit better. Okay, so let's do the last one, which is one ounce Australia, half ounce Texas. All right, so the nose on this one. 
I love how restrained it became. It's not yet like, it's not like I'm being breathed on. The other one seemed like it was like, I don't know, hot, steamy, almost like give volatile, giving off um, some heat or some, uh, some alcohol. It would just like when you put your nose in the glass, it felt humid and hot. <clears throat> The, the fruitiness, the, the, the black fruit, the blue fruit from the straw is definitely coming forward. It smells richer. So it smells like a little bit more of a, a, a wine that has um, some age to it. Like there's a little bit more complexity. Oh, wow. And then on the palate, it's totally soft and... Um, lens with blue, spicy fruit, kind of plummy fruit, no better finish. Oak is apparent. Uh, the finish is lingering. Wow, that's a really good blend too. In our early days here at Venovium, we had a wine called Two Worlds and it was, uh, Craig, I don't remember the blends at all. I don't know if you remember the blends. Um, but I think part of it was Tempranillo, part of it was Cab. I can't really remember. But that was super popular. And it was, you know, those of you that know it for sale in Texas only is, it was the wine that we had to say is for sale in Texas only because it was it had Spanish wine in it, had California wine in it, had Texas wine in it. And it was just a, an, a, an oddity that was just so good just from pieces that we had here around the winery that we put together. Um, that turned out to be a really great wine. Um, that's the, you know, next time you guys come in, you know, we, when you go to a winery, they, they, they say, okay, this is this wine. This is from this bottle, from this vintage, from this growing place. And it is what it is. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, next time you guys come into Vinovian, because of all the wines that are on tap, you can do whatever blending you want to do. Uh, so if you want to do some blending next time you're in, please uh, Let's make that happen. All right, friends, I really appreciate you guys. Enjoy the rest of your wines. We'll talk to you soon. I'll stick around for a little bit in case you have any questions. And then uh, we'll see y'all soon.